So I want to welcome everybody to our uh, webinar today, Iranian Revolution at 43. Uh, we are fortunate to have two prominent experts who will discuss this topic today. I'm Baman Bakhiri, Executive Director of the Basketball Institute. We are very grateful to our sponsors and supporters to, who help us with uh, having this kind of conversation series and really helping our mission of improving and educating Iranians and Americans about each other, about each other's history, about each other's politics, and the history of friendship between the United States and Iran. So we also want to welcome students and faculty from Emory and Henry College and from Brigham Young University's David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies. We are very grateful that you have joined us for this talk. So uh, before taking any more time, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Susan Maloney, who have, whom I have known for many, many years. Uh, she's currently the Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. She has authored and or edited several books on Iran, including The Iranian Revolution at 40, Iran's Political Economy Since the Revolution, and Iran's Long Reach that was published, I believe, by U.S. Institute of Peace. She has also published numerous articles in journals, academic policy, as well as media outlets like New York Times and Wall Street Journal. I think she's unique to have been both an advisor to both Democratic and Republican administrations when it comes to Iran. And she received her doctorate from Fletcher School of Diplomacy. And she also spent time in Iran on language learning and part of the exchange that we have between us and iran so she has an experience of having been to iran our other participant is with a well-known uh ambassador ambassador john limberg uh, he's a uh, retired foreign service officer and an academic uh, he spent 33 years in the u.s foreign service he uh, served in in the middle east as ambassador to islamic republic of mauritania in 2009 to 10, they, uh, I think, dragged them out of retirement and brought them to uh, help them with the Iran policy as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Near Eastern Affairs for Iranian policy. He holds a PhD from Harvard, has taught at the US Naval Academy, and before uh, uh, Iranian Revolution, Ambassador Limbert spent time in Iran as Peace Corps officer. He, uh, he lived in Kurdistan. Uh, live and also taught at Shiraz University. I have to say that he is the best speaking fluent Persian speaker American. I think he did get a high score in the State Department when he came to Persian language. Is that right, Ambassador Limbert? You were? I can't remember that far back, Bahman. I think, I think it might've been sometime during the Wilson administration or the Harding administration. Yeah. Well, uh, he's also an, an author, he's written um, book called Iran at War with History, Shiraz in the Age of Hafez, and Negotiating with Iran. And I like that subtitle in the Negotiating with Iran, Wrestling with the Ghosts of History. So wrestling is even included in that subtitle. Uh, his latest book is a novel, it's a, it's a fiction, called Believers, Love and Destiny in Tehran, co-authored with Ambassador Mark Grossman. We are very happy to inform everyone that we are translating that book into Persian and our institute is currently working with a translator to publish that book in Persian. So for today's uh, discussion, we thought we'd run this as a conversation about Iran, Iranian revolution, what has meant, and how do we look at Iran 43 years later? So let me start with you, Susan, first. Looking back at Iran, looking back on the last years of the Shah's regime, and emergence of Ayatollah Khomeini as the leader of the revolution. How would you describe the revolution? Why did Iran have this revolution? And this revolution is being called Iranian revolution, Islamic revolution. How, what is the appropriate way of referring to that uh, major change that happened in Iran? Well, thanks, Bahman. I will say it is a um, it is a tough question to be asked to answer with this audience and with this uh, panel amongst us. So, uh, recognizing that we have with us someone who is there, uh, present at the creation, 
um, I will give uh, perhaps a perspective from an academic point of view, but, but really defer to, to John as well as to you um, for your expertise on, on this issue. But, but first, I really did want to say thank you for this opportunity. As we were talking in the, in, in the moments before we went live, um, I said I don't get a chance to do as much Iran as I used to do. Um, I spent a lot of time just uh, managing an organization, and so it's a it's a, a great uh, privilege and and treat, frankly, for me to be here today of all days and to be able to have this conversation on this set of issues. Um, you know, obviously, the uh, revolution in Iran is one of the kind of seminal events in the history of the 20th century, and I think it still is very much um, a. a a major kind of um, shadow that hangs over the American foreign policy establishment. And obviously, John himself can speak much more directly to this, but it was this kind of catalyzing experience for all those policymakers who lived through it, for journalists, um, and for even for ordinary Americans. I was, uh, frankly, <laughs> fairly young at the time. Um, but even from my own sort of political memory, it's probably one of the first major international events that was uh, present in my life in a very small town in America when people gathered and, and uh, put yellow ribbons around trees and had special church services to, to um, mark the absence uh, of John and uh, for other U.S. diplomats who were held hostage in Iran for 444 days. And so that, that experience, but also the revolution that of course preceded it um, by a number of months um, really did, I think, change the framing for many American policymakers, historians, and, and really all those who looked at the world because there had been this perception, and I think it was probably a false perception that, there was, that, that the Shah was invulnerable, that Iran was a state moving uh, favorably toward democracy and toward historical progression, in part through the tutelage and support and partnership of various American administrations um, in the wake of 1953, who had uh, invested in Iran, both economically and from a security relationship, to try to bolster the, the, the government and try to ensure that Iran was a not just a, a stable partner, but really a kind of crucial partner in uh, the kind of post-British management of the, the wider Middle East. Um, and, and so to see this uh, movement emerge seemingly from out of nowhere and to topple a government that had received so much direct support, um, both in terms of finance, in terms of military sales, in terms of direct you know, personal relationships, both at the kind of political level, but of course at every level. And again, I keep looking at John, but he can speak to this. The amount of cultural uh, and educational and, and business relationships that existed between the United States and Iran, it's almost impossible to, to conceive of for those of us who, who, who weren't present at the creation because it's so um, at odds with the vision of Iran that we have today, but there was a campus of Harvard Business School in in Iran before the revolution, there was a, you know, sort of it was a destination for Hollywood movie stars. Uh, this was a, a, a very close and important relationship for the United States. And so to see this revolution emerge, take down the government was it was in many respects, a, I think, a shocking event. And as I said, continues to frame um, the way that we see the world. I will say based on, you know, a lot of scholarship that has been done um, and there's, you know, there's probably a library of books that have been written about the causes and consequences of the Iranian revolution. Um, in my view, I think, you know, with the obvious benefit of retrospective history, we shouldn't have been surprised. Um, there were plenty of warning signals. Um, and, and yet, you know, both within the government and frankly, outside of government, including academics uh, and people who did travel back and forth, the revolution came as a surprise. Um, and I think that is as important as anything else to recognize that despite the fact that there was a, you know, there were uh, all kinds of precursors in terms of um, dissatisfaction, evidence of, of uh, alienation among the population, economic pressures, um, violent social movements that were emerging as early as the early 70s uh, and, and evidence that the Shah himself was no longer capable of managing the pressures that, that were facing him. Um, you know, the world remained to some extent blind to the potential risks. And so 
I, you know, I think of the Iranian revolution and I do refer to it as, as the Iranian revolution rather than the Islamic revolution, although obviously those from other vantage points, uh, including the regime itself, of course, today would, would, would frame it differently. Um, it, it was very much an Iranian revolution in the sense that it, 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 it was not just Islamists who went to the street. It was not even just Muslims who went to the street. It was people from all walks of life in Iran. Um, who uh, came out to voice their frustration with uh, the existing government and to push for something different. They didn't agree on what that something different should be. And that is uh, part of the reason uh, that we got to where we are today. But I, uh, I would say just to, in closing for this portion of the conversation, to me, one of the most important takeaways for all those of us who are looking at policy toward Iran today, but also more widely in the region and around the rest of the world is that we uh, were blind to um, what should have been obvious to us, which was the vulnerability of a system that we had invested so heavily in, we were, we were uh, determined to believe that it would last forever. Well, thank you very much for that. Absolutely. I think uh, the mosaic of forces that came together during the revolution, they all came together because of their opposition to the Shah, not so much of what they get along with, right? So that mosaic of which you rightly emphasize, from National Front to the left to the religious, it made it did make it an Iranian revolution. So to John, why, I mean, going back a little bit following on Susan's uh, um, point, why do you think it was so difficult for American policymakers to anticipate the revolution and its aftermath? I mean, you were one of the few diplomats who had lived in Iran before the revolution, spoke the language, and probably was more aware about the social, historical, and changes within the country. But in dealing with your colleagues, why do you think there was such a lack of uh, openness to uh, looking at Iran at that time going through this change that would lead to a revolution? Good. Well, thank you, Bahman, and thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Suzanne, and uh, thanks again to Basker, to the Baskerville Institute. Um, Bahman, you are doing wonderful work uh, in the programs. Please, uh, please, please keep it up. And thank you for the invitation today on Valentine's Day. There's a lot of love in the subject. In the subject, I guess we have to find it, but it's there. <laughs> I'm sure it's the. Uh, I'm sure it's there. Also. Greetings to I, I, um, I was looking at the list of attendees and I'm really very humbled because there's an awful lot of knowledge out there. There's an awful lot of knowledge and understanding out there. I look forward to the discussion and the question session, uh, question session hearing. Um, I'm sorry there's not time. I could take the whole hour and a half and greet people one by uh, uh, one by one, but I see a lot of friends from many times from universities from peace corps and from many other places uh, from many other places so thank you for thank you for coming um my own uh, if i've learned anything over my, my association with iran goes back about almost 60 years the first time i went there um john kennedy was president um and uh, ali amini was uh prime minister uh, 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 of Iran. And if I've learned anything, uh, it's be, be prepared to be wrong a lot. Uh, because that's what, ha that's, that's what happens. And the, 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 the prediction business um, in relation to Iran is a very tricky one, uh, uh, is a very tricky one. Um, I didn't see the revolution coming. Um, I don't know if anyone did. And I, I know people have since popped up and claimed that uh, they did, uh, but I don't, I don't think so. Now, I, I was trained as a historian. So, and when you ask a historian question, like question as you did, a uh, historian will say, well, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, now, in the case of Iran, un unfortunately, the beginning is an awful long time ago. So we're not going to go back to Cyrus the Great and the Book of Daniel and that that time. But we we can go back. Um, we can go back about a hundred over a hundred years to the late the late nineteenth century, early twentieth. Uh, 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 20th century, and I know Baskerville's done a lot. Baskerville's just done a lot of work uh, 
um, on that period. Uh, 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 on that period, and what we see is about 120 years of a struggle of a country that has been exploited, dominate, dominated, humiliated. Uh, deprived economically and, and socially in a very bad place. I mean, the, the literacy rate in Iran in 1905 was estimated to be about 5%. Uh, life expectancy was about 30 years. Um, and it was not the master of its own house. And see, so what you've seen for the past 120 years is the struggle to for Iranians to become masters in their own house, to take control of their own country take care of their own country. I mean, Morgan Schuster, that was the idea. You, we, we get control of our finances, the National Front and the oil. We get control of our oil, um, 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 our resources. Um, with, with, the, with getting rid of the monarchy, I think it was a question of this rule, ruler is inauthentic. He's, some, he's someone put in by the foreign, someone put in by the foreigners um, who takes uh, orders from the form uh, uh, takes orders from the foreigners, um, and they had examples of that from the um, <clears throat> military, the military immunity law of nineteen, the controversy over the military immunity law of nineteen sixty three and nineteen sixty four. Uh, the the appointment of uh, Richard Helms as ambassador in nineteen seventy in, in, in nineteen seventy three. Very few people, I think, very few people on the American side uh, understood the symbolism of that of such an appointment. I mean, here we were simply saying to the Iranians, um, "We we're telling you who's in charge," and it's really rubbing their faces it was rubbing people's faces in it. Uh, but at the same time. If you looked at Iran, at the, when President Carter went to Iran in, in the end of 1978 for New Year's, for his famous New Year, and gave his famous New Year's Eve toast, for which he's been roundly criticized. Uh, but in fact, if you had looked at Iran at that at that point, late 1978, you would have said, "Oh well, then sure, there are problems, uh, but." Things are okay. I mean, the, the economy is good, uh, producing oil, 6 million barrels of oil a day, prices are high, the economy is, the economy is booming, they begin to open up the society, look at the progress made by women, look at the progress made by women, look at the progress in education, infrastructure, infrastructure all the things. So you could have been forgiven for, I think, saying, well, okay, Things are pretty good. I'll, I'll, I'll end with a comment from a British colleague who once said, I think he said he was the, the ambassador there. I can't remember his name, but he said, um, if in 1978, I, in 1977, excuse me, um, I had said that in a year the Shah is going to be gone and Iran will be in chaos dominated by a theocrat. Uh, an aging cleric with a medieval education, um, my government would have, as the phrase goes, psychovacked me. They would have pulled me out and sent me to a mental institution. And they, he said, and then he added, and it would have been right to do so. Nobody got it, you know, in, in a word. Why didn't they get it? Well, that's that we could do a whole class. Uh, um, that we could do a whole class on. Uh, but I mean, at, at a certain level, you could sense unease. You could sense dissatisfaction. Um, the oil money hadn't really made life much better for most people. Most people it had aggravated class differences and economic differences. There were shortage, there were, there were shortages, there was congestion, there was pollution, there were electrical, um, electrical cuts, but to all that, does all that add up to a revolution? Um, probably, you know, probably not in that time. But the US, and why didn't the US get it? Well, we, that's again, the, our, my, my friend, the late James Bill wrote a whole book on the sub, wrote a whole book on the subject, brilliant. Uh, but I think the underlying reason is the U.S. 
at a policy level, um, didn't care. Our interest was the Cold War. And that was above, that was our pro, that was our prime directive. Our prime directive was uh, Iran, the communists shall not come into Iran. They shall not uh, take Iranian territory. They shall not get influence in the, uh, uh, in the government. They shall not touch Iranian uh, oil. The rest of us, the rest of it didn't matter. And if people like, if I saw things or my friends saw things or others, others uh, saw things that made them, made them uneasy, frankly, um, from, from a policy point of view, uh, that didn't matter very much. You're muted. Uh, Just the final follow-up, John. Several books about the revolution have talked about how the Shah's government would not take it very lightly if the American embassy contacted the opposition in Iran, wrote any kind of report about the level of opposition to him in Iran. And there, I think this is also reported in other books that uh, uh, the Shah's government had a condition on American embassy that uh, diplomats or ambassadors who come there, they will refrain from directly contacting opposition leaders. Is that uh, a point that could have led to the lack of understanding from what is happening in Iran? Uh, it may have been there. I don't know if there was anything formal, Bahman, that, that any formal agreement uh, it, might, it probably was was understood was, was understood that um, too much contact with the opposition made people uneasy made uh, uh, made the government made the authorities uneasy. But at the same time, uh, again, for the reasons that I talk about uh, that I mentioned, um, there really wasn't a lot of interest within policy. I mean, you didn't if you if if you went out and did some and 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 looked at dissatisfaction and from whatever source uh, you didn't have a big audience there wasn't much of an uh, there wasn't much of an audience in addition to that um within the within the state department at least uh, <clears throat> there was never any much of an effort to form a cadre um of what uh, of people who knew iran i see who knew the language, who would go there for repeat to, I mean, we had our Soviet experts, we had our, uh, we had our Japanese experts, we had our Arabic experts, but typically people, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Arnie Rafel and others, they went out there, uh, Bill Miller, they, they, they went out there, they served the tour, they did really well, they got good start in the language, they met people, they went around, they did all the right things. Um, and then uh, they went on to, I don't know, Colombia or uh, uh, Colombia or Italy or some other place um, and never came back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, the, and the idea that you, you know, that it was worthwhile, mm -hmm. it was worthwhile to develop this cadre, this expertise um, wasn't there. So then the people at the sort of the, the crucial level, the political counselor, economic counselor level uh, at the embassy were very new. Um, and so they ended up talking to the same, basically the same group of Iranians who were about as out of touch with the realities of the country as everybody else, as, as everybody else. I, I used to, the way I described it, I sort of paraphrased uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, and I said, you know, never have, um, ha have so many known so few who knew so little for so long. And that was the case. That 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 was the case because the, the people were not there. The people who could have developed into um, into the specialists never did. Um, and I think it maybe traces back to this whole war obsession that I referred to. I see. Thank you. So, Susan, when we go back now and uh, study the revolution and its aftermath many, many Iranians and observers were surprised at how the post-revolutionary dynamics that finally led to the attack on the American embassy in November of 1979, and even after that, how brutal the regime had become in terms of a kind of a pushing an ideology, kind of getting rid of all the groups that 
help them to come to the revolution, try to monopolize the power. So how do we look at that process now as having a big impact on Iran today? So if one example of not understanding the revolution was that Americans and us all, we have to study the country more uh, in deeply and understand those things in order to be able to anticipate. So how do we look at those one or two years after the revolution in Iran and the developments that happen has kind of, even today, has kept the Iranian regime a kind of a hostage to its own policies, if I could say that. So how would you describe the two year, one year after the revolution and what has happened that has determined the course of Iran today? Well, I think you put it very uh, appropriately in the sense that, uh, you know, that period of time, which was really tantamount to a civil war um, it, among the factions that helped bring about the ouster of the Shah has shaped all the, the subsequent decades uh, and policies of the Iranian government and, and, and particularly with respect to its approach to the world, but in, in many other ways as well. Um, you know, one can look at that, uh, you know, sort of early honeymoon period uh, with a provisional government that incorporated uh, elements of, of different ideological factions that had a, a, a sort of liberal nationalist uh, with Islamist orientation as a prime minister. Um, and, and think of that as, as the opportunity that was squandered. Um, mm. But in effect, I don't, you know, I, I would say that was not really at that stage, um, uh, an American opportunity to either win or lose. Um, obviously, um, what's notable and what's often forgotten, obviously not by most of those who are, uh, who are commenting in the chat who have some long experience with Iran, but certainly I find from students uh, in the current generation who just are, are only familiar with Iran in the post-revolutionary, in the latter post-revolutionary period, um, this, this, uh, you know, it often comes as a surprise that the orientation of the American government as of this time in 1979, 43 years ago, was to try to find some modus vivendi with uh, the revolutionary regime. Um, it was still very much in an inchoate state, um, still very much subject to a lot of chaos on the streets and competition among all the different factions, both at the political level and at the social and popular level. Uh, and all of those dynamics, I think, help drive things in favor of extremists. There are certainly places where you can point to missteps uh, by the US government or occasions when, say, congressional activism helped play into the hands of extremists. But ultimately, I think the, the greater challenge was that from the outset, Khomeini knew what he wanted. He was prepared to use force and unprepared to compromise in any way to get what he wanted. That helped him in, in effect push for the revolution at a time even in the period of 77 and 78 when he was uh, helping to coalesce other leaders again from across the ideological spectrum among the Iranian opposition. That uncompromising nature, I think helped bring about the ouster of the Shah because there were certainly those among the revolutionary coalition would have compromised, who would have been satisfied with a change in the in the position of the premier or other uh, types of policy changes from the Shah. It was Khomeini who said, no, we must see his ouster. And having affected that, he remained essentially uncompromising, but also incredibly calculating, incredibly good at reading the political winds, taking advantage of opportunities and pushing his own interests and his own agenda. You know, there, there will, I assume, perennially be a debate about to what extent uh, others among and close to Khomeini really understood what the implications of Velayat Sefaqi would be if, in fact, it was fully implemented. Did uh, Bazargan and others really believe that there was a way to create a sort of uh, functioning Republican system that would limit the authority of the Supreme Guide to essentially a sort of, um, uh, you know, Pope off? in, in Qom, um, presiding over moral dictums, but having absolutely no impact on day-to-day -day policy making or law. But it was certainly clear uh, within 1979 and, and uh, you know, even before the seizure of the U.S. Embassy that, that Khomeini wanted more than simply just a moral voice. He wanted real power and he was prepared to take risks. He was prepared to countenance violence. 
in order to achieve that. Uh, and over time, in part because of the response of some of those who he was trying to marginalize, um, that violence helped to push things in Iran in favor of the most extreme elements of the revolutionary coalition and to really enable Khomeini to consolidate power amongst, amongst uh, those who supported his interpretation of a government that would be essentially bifurcated, uh, one that did uh, entail and incorporate the, uh, uh, the representative institutions which had been part of the Iranian political system uh, since the constitutional revolution, but one that essentially um, sub subsumed those within a system in which uh, Khomeini himself had ultimate authority and unlimited authority. And that is a system that has been built upon and strengthened um, by his successor, Ali Khamenei, and that has really, I think, subverted any real opportunities to try to modulate or reform or to uh, institute real political changes that would reflect what we uh, understand to be the will of a large number of Iranians who've come to the streets on various occasions to push for greater political and social uh, rights for their for themselves. Um, those critical two years, I you know, I, I think uh, in many ways have shaped the forty years that followed. Yeah, well, I think so, and I think uh, John went to Iran in August, if I can remember, August of nineteen seventy nine, joined the embassy. That's correct. Yes, that, that that was excellent timing on my part. Ex excellent timing on your part, and so. If we look at some of the major events that has had a lasting impact on Iran today happened from November 4th to January 1981, during the hostage crisis. And Iranian constitution, if I can remember, was passed in a referendum in December 1979. Uh, the first Iranian presidential election by the, well, the late Manisad who passed away was held in January following that month. And, U.S. did not break diplomatic relations with Iran when was until April 1980, if I can remember. I mean, U.S. had diplomatic relations with Khomeini's regime until April 1980, right? So that period of the 444 days may mean different things to different people. But as, long, as far as the revolutionaries were concerned, they looked at that as an opportunity to exactly what Susan talked about, to monopolize, to centralize, right, to take control. How, I mean, you were at the embassy at that time when these things were happening. Were you aware of the changes like that that were taking place in Iran? Well, when I was still on the street uh, during that, uh, about for about 12 weeks from August until November, uh, uh, November um, I mean, it was, uh, I, I think Suzanne described it as chaos, and it was, uh, but it was terribly exciting. I mean, as this is as a as a foreign service officer, this is what you live for. Uh, my my friend uh, Mike Petrinko described it as like watching a, a tornado come down your street. You know, it's fascinating, <laughs> and you, you 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 know you you don't use your head; you go out and you look at it rather than taking shelter in your basement as you probably should be said, oh, isn't that amazing? Um, I often say to people and uh, people think I'm crazy, but I said, you know, those, that period, um, you know, what did you, what did you think during those, that, during that period, the, the late summer, early fall of 79? They said, well, I was having too much fun. Uh, it was, it was, it was incredibly exciting. You mentioned the constitution for the constitutional assembly. They were writing a constitution. I remember going, visiting one of the delegates and we sat with him and we talked about um, the American constitution. And we talked about what happened in Philadelphia and the different arguments that were made and what kind of system that they, the, uh, they had. I mean, there was a sense that possi there were possibilities there. Now, maybe we were living in a fool's paradise. I mean, it was going to shut down. Uh, uh, um, it was going to shut down. Um, um, and it did. Uh, but I think uh, uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people hope for something better. Um, but remember the remember the joke that was going around at the time, uh, at the time, Batman, maybe you remember it was, uh, you know, Chief Ekadimu Chishod. What 
what did we think would happen and what really did happen? Yeah. Quite different. Uh, um, uh, quite different. And Suzanne is quite right. You know, here is um, Khomeini's book on lectures on Islamic government. Uh, he laid it out very clearly. Um, he was not interested in pluralism, democracy, constitution, constitution. None of that is in. None of that is in there. Um, he is reconstructing the theocratic state of seventh century Medina. Uh, of century Medina, um, and those who understood that, his clerical allies were the people who emerged on top uh, in the power struggle. As I said before, um, if this revolution, like previous movements uh, in Iran, was about Iranians becoming masters in their own house, um, then the, the ongoing struggle was who was going to be the master? Which Iranian was going to be the master? And what kind of house was it going to be? Mm -hmm. And uh, our mission at the US Embassy, and you can call us, you can say that we were naive, you can say we were misled, uh, you can say we were, bl uh, uh, we were blind, uh, was to uh, make some kind of lemonade out of all this, preserve some kind of relationship. That, those were our instructions. That was our, that was our mission, some kind of relationship with whatever came after the uh, after the monarchy and the uh, the overriding priority again were cold war priority were uh, for geostrategic reasons cold war uh, cold war reasons uh, that was our mission um, it turned out it was how would you call it a fool's errand uh, or mission impossible but that's what it was but that's what it was but you could see in uh, summer of 79, uh, things were not going in a friendly direction. They were not going in the direction leading to that kind of relationship. Of course, once President Carter, whom I admire a great deal, uh, once President Carter um, agreed to admit the Shah to the United States for medical treatment, uh, then uh, the game was over. I mean, then, to all intents and purposes, uh, the uh, how can I say it? the the uh, the demo the moderate provisional government uh, was finished. Uh, any hope of a relationship was finished, and most important for me, at least, and my friends, um, we were finished. Mm. Thank you. That's that's absolutely right. So let me also remind the audience that please send your questions in the chat room and question and answer. This is a conversation, and we want to get you engaged in these topics. So I hope we will soon. Yeah, I want to go. I want to kind of uh, wrap up some observations that we can now take it to the audience. So Susan, looking back at these forty-three years, we are. It's clear that uh, the the process in Iran has not been what many people expected, as John said. What we are seeing today, you see this uh, endemic corruption, economic mismanagement, international sanctions, and this continuous struggle and the whole saga about the nuclear issue since what, 1980s, right? And so Iran today, if people look at it and they want to celebrate the 43rd anniversary of revolution, people will be looking at it differently, right? because of these factors. So how would you describe these dynamics that have happened in Iran? Is it because of the centralization of power by the clerics? Is it because of sanctions on Iran? Is it because of these bad policies like the war, continuing the war for eight years, putting a fat one, Salman Rushdie? And so how would you describe how Iran got to be what it is in this shape where I'm from that optimistic revolution of democracy coming and so forth like that. You've written a good book on political economy of Iran. You have focused on the economy. So how would you tell our audience that today's Iran is facing these issues is because of XYZ policies? Uh, 
I wish there were a simple answer because that would suggest there's a simple solution to um, getting Iran out of the mess that it's in today. And unfortunately, I, I don't think either one of the either the the explanation or the answer is a simple one. Um, I, I think you know what has happened to Iran over the course of these 43 years has been a, a huge tragedy. Um, because there was so much promise and so much anticipation at the time of the revolution by so many Iranians, because there have been other moments in time, um, particularly uh, in the late 1990s, when it did appear that Iran was going to be able to uh, see a reformation of the government from within the government itself, um, a, a sort of um, embrace of, of a new kind of thinking that might lead to either the, the wholesale um, uh, liberalization of political, the political environment in Iran and the economic environment, uh, or something even more transformative, uh, a change in the regime itself. Neither one of those things happened. And, and what we've seen since the birth and, and I think slow death of the reform movement in Iran has been a hardening of the regime. Um, and uh, a, a much more inauspicious environment for any kind of uh, either inside track of reform or outside track of opposition uh, effort to have any real impact on the governing structure or for that matter on the economic structure of Iran. Um, and of course, those two things are intertwined. Um, what we've seen since 1989 in particular has been a growing centralization of power under the auspices of the Office of the Supreme Leader. Uh, one can interpret that in different ways, but in, at least in my read, it, it was a reaction by Khamenei to um, the, the need to really consolidate his own authority, having come into that position uh, without the charisma, without the legacy of, of clerical authority that his predecessor had. Um, and at a time of, of uh, real flux in terms of Iran's regional position with the recent end of the war, and in terms of the, the wider international system um, with the, the not long thereafter collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so what Khamenei has done steadily over the course of the past nearly 35 years is to essentially coup proof and reform proof the Islamic Republic. He has uh, ensured that he holds all the levers of power, that those who contest those levers of power are either marginalized uh, or co-opted or forced or persuaded to emigrate out of the country. Uh, and so in effect, you don't have a serious opposition movement either at the political level in terms of those who uh, have any real uh, say in trying to push for meaningful reforms to the political system, um, or uh, an opposition movement on the streets, although you do see um, regular signs of dissatisfaction and protest. Um, no regime is resilient forever. Every regime uh, at some point in time experiences significant cracks. Um, this one in particular is highly dependent upon a generation of people who came of age in the late 1970s and, and mid 1980s. And many of those people are passing from the scene. There are certainly a second and third generation of stalwart revolutionaries who are determined to preserve the Islamic Republic, but they can't do it in a vacuum. They have to engage in the wider international system. Um, the, the dynamics of, of the international system now are I, unfortunately favorable to authoritarians. Uh, Raisi and Khamenei have found common cause with uh, Xi Jinping of China and Putin of Russia. Um, but ultimately, this is a, a dynamic young country, most Iranians born long after the Islamic Revolution, many born after the end of the Iran-Iraq War. They want something better for themselves and for their families. They understand the world around them thanks to the dispersion of technology. And I'm confident, um, you know, it's been a long time since I've been able to go back to Iran, but I'm confident from my own experience there and from my own continuing contacts with people in Iran, that when the moment comes, Iran is going to be poised to be a much, uh, an, the most successful and prosperous democracy in the Middle East. There's no question in my mind, this has been a long and grueling preparatory period. Um, but uh, Iranians have debated uh, the, the, uh, the opportunity that they lost in 79 and they won't lose it again. Well, oh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's great. Uh, I think, um, so my final question before going to the audience is that uh, it seems like Susan is more optimistic about the prospects of modifying or transforming 
the Islamic Republic due to this demographic and the causes that you mentioned. Um, so maybe this regime will witness something what happened in Eastern Europe, right? Could be the same things that happened to other revolutions in other parts of the world. So uh, in that sense, I wanted to, for my final question is gonna focus on why there is such a disparity in terms of opposition viewing these countries on the verge of another revolution. And yet within Iran, it seems to me people are averse or risk averse to having another revolution because of those causes that you talked about in the beginning. And so they're worried about if we have another revolution, is it gonna to lead to another dictatorial system? So to conclude everything, I want to both of you to make some concluding remarks about how do we, first for American foreign policy, what is the right policy toward Iran today considering all these domestic changes? And for you, Susan, how do we uh, assure that the new generation of power or people coming to power are not gonna do the same thing the revolutionaries did in 79. John, you wanna go first? Wait, I, the question was, what is the right policy? Yeah, what is the, I mean, what is the right approach by American policymakers toward Iran today? Witnessing all these things that Susan mentioned, the, uh, the demonstrations and all that, in contrast to what they missed in 79, right? Okay, so, but, but yeah. you know, great question. And we can, you know, probably have another three hours on that on that one. But I was, look, by the way, I was looking at the chat and one of the, uh, one of the people in the audience mentioned the film, Tahmini Milani's film, uh, The Hidden Half, Nime Penhan. Uh, watch that uh, because it's, it's one of the best and most honest portrayals of the struggles in the post-revolutionary period in 79 and, uh, and 80. And it's, it's remarkable that it was allowed to be made because it's very sympathetic to some of the leftist, group, uh, uh, to some of the leftist groups. Um, but there's a wonderful character and there also Zahra Khanum, who was actually quite active among the, uh, the Besiji and the Hezbollahi gangs uh, at, the uh, at the time, quite a colorful, char quite a co a colorful character. Um, anyway, what should be the policy? A um, couple of principles. Um, I mean, I'm, I, it's, uh, I, I'm very wary of sort of sitting and telling my colleagues who are struggling with these uh, with these issues. And this is this stuff is really hard. I mean, a lot of very smart people are spending very long hours working, working these issues. Um, but I suppose just some basics. One is um, have goals. What do you want? Um, someone said has, has uh, uh, U.S. policy in Iran, toward Iran, you know, how, what's, has it been successful? Has it been unsuccessful? Well, as long as you don't have any goal, define goals, um, you can't measure success. Have you, what have you achieved? Um, I, I love to quote um, Lewis Carroll and the Cheshire Cat, you know, who said, uh, well, if you, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Um, and that's that's unfortunately it's where we've been. Do we want uh, do we want this? Do we want the whole government to collapse? Do we want the country to split up? Uh, do we want a democracy? Do we want a new strongman? Do we want a, a, a country that's subservient? What what do we want? What and not just uh, but then also what we want um, is secondary <laughs> to what. <laughs> What we want, we might not get. Uh, and what we want is secondary to what the people of the country want. This doesn't just go for Iran, but it goes for other, other places. I would say, I would uh, experience for me, I mean, I served in Iraq, I served in Iran, uh, served in uh, Iran and I've seen firsthand the consequences of um, poorly judged, uh, Inter uh, intervention or ill-considered uh, intervention without considering second, third, fourth, 
tenth order consequences, tenth uh, 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 order order consequences. So maybe the principle is do no harm in the first place. But then, if you are going to do something, like if you are going to um, order an airstrike against a Revolutionary Guard commander, for example, um, ask your you, you must ask the question: What is the purpose of this? What does this achieve? Does it achieve something beyond? Because unfortunately, um, so it seems to me, so much of um, our policy has been a policy of we'll do it because it feels good. And it gives us a certain gratification uh, because they humiliated us. 40 some years ago, 43 years, 40 some years ago, and therefore we're going to get, we're going to, by God, we're going to do something to that. We're going to do something to that. Uh, stay away from um, the slogans. Stay away from things like slogans like dual containment and maximum pressure. Um, th those don't do you much good. Watch, watch your words. Words matter a lot in something like this. And maybe this gets down to the idea of practice diplomacy. Uh, now, I know we've had, a, we had an administration for a few years that didn't seem to believe in diplomacy, that didn't seem to believe in diplomacy, but it works. Um, it works. You accomplish that. You 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 accomplish things because you cannot you cannot force the other side into if you cannot force the other side into submission and you can't uh, in this case, how do you achieve what you want? Uh, what you want? So um, diplomacy works. Uh, unfortunately, the the tools of diplomacy, you know, patience, forbearance, uh, listening, carefully weighing words, all of these things um, have gotten a little bit rusty. Uh, and they're in a, I, they, I think they're in a toolbox that's been sitting unused in a garage for many years. So we've got to sort of get that toolbox out, oil them up and start using them. You know, when I, in, in 2009, 2010, when I went, came out of retirement, went back to the State Department, worked on um, Iran policy, um, I found what I discovered was that it was um, for most of my colleagues, there were a lot of colleagues really trying to trying to do the right things. But for many uh, in the U.S. government, it was all sanctions all the time. And meetings were usually about, well, what other sanctions can we do? What other sanctions can we uh, can we have? And if you suggested that there were other possibilities and other ways of doing things, um, again, you, you didn't have much of an audience. You didn't get it there. So what do you do? What, uh, uh, what do you, uh, uh, what do you do? Um, recognize, recognize the limits of what you can do. Recognize the limits of how a foreign country, any foreign country, uh, strong as it might be, economic powerful as it might be, the limits of what it can do to affect e events in another in, a, in another country, and recognize from history, and this is where the history comes. This is where I I, I think history is so important. Uh, recognize the fact uh, that when you do attempt to change the course of events, you often end up with an with an outcome that you don't want, don't necessarily want. Just one example, and then I'll back off. Then I'll back off. Uh, 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 Suzanne quite rightly referred to um, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's ideas and what he what what he was urging. Um, if you look at the history, Ayatollah Khomeini became a nationalist figure, a figure to whom um, more than just religious groups could adhere and follow. Uh, because of the gift that the United States government gave him by insisting on the passage of the military immunity bill back in 1963 and 1964. Until then, 
he, he had followers, but they were they were on religious causes, things like co-education, votes for women, things like that. After 63 and 64, um, he was a national hero. And so you had, pe you had people from the National Front and you had people from the Freedom Movement and you had teachers and professionals and doctors marching under his banner of Iranian nationalism. Well, who made him? I hate to say this, but the United States government, we had a large role in constructing this person. Thank you very much, John. That was an excellent observation. So I go from a question, there's a question for Susan, which is along the same line as John has been talking about. Uh, the question is, says, Washington gave a green light to Iraqis to invade Iran in 1980. The Iraq-Iran war ironically prolonged the longevity of the Islamic Republic. Yet another gross miscalculation on the part of US officials or a calculated act to sell arms to the region. So how would you, I guess, going back on what John is saying that it seems like miscalculation by US continuously gives uh, an excuse to some of these extremist leaders to pursue what they want or even build support for it. And could this questioners about what we did regarding Iraq could also be another one that we are still living with. Thanks, Mahman. Let me go back to um, a couple of points that John made because I do think um, there's probably a good and useful illumination of a difference of opinion here. Um, I think that there's been some clarity from the US government about what we want from Iran. And it's fairly simple. We want a, a government that is at peace with its neighbors and with its own population. We want a government that is playing a constructive role rather than seeking to build weapons of mass destruction. We want a government that is no, not promoting uh, or funding or training or financing uh, terrorists uh, across the broader Middle East and beyond, or, and a government that is not helping to affect those uh, policies against uh, American assets, uh, personnel, or partners around the region. Uh, I think where we have struggled <laughs> mightily, as, as I think John um, rightly detailed, is in trying to find policies that actually achieve that. And so you, you find a vacillation at times from um, the two tools that uh, the, the crisis group that was put together at the White House in the days after the seizure of the U.S. Embassy in 1979 cited as the primary ways to try to influence Iranian policy, pressure and persuasion. Um, and, and that was, you know, the, the sort of recipe in, 19, in November 1979. It's been the same recipe for every U.S. administration, Republican or Democrat, ever since. They've both used coercive tools, both economic and military, and both parties, presidents from both parties have used diplomacy and persuasion to try to bring Iran uh, into some different framework. And frankly, no combination from either political party um, has worked very effectively for very long um, with Iran. And so I think we have to be um, honest about the, the nature of this challenge that ultimately even the United States with a lot of influence around the world and a lot of tools in its toolbox has limitations on what actually it can do even uh, with respect to a country like Iran. Um, and so I, I, I think there is a, a general agreement about what the goals are. They, they've been called different things. Sometimes they're called dual, that was you know, dual containment, I think had six goals at different points. There, I think Trump had like 13, I can never remember. But I mean, basically what we want is in Iran, which is a, a constructive player in the region and, and one in which uh, Iranians actually have the opportunity to pursue political uh, and economic opportunity in their own country. I do think also that we have used diplomacy routinely. Um, and, uh, you know, John and I know many of the same people, but, you know, I, at least for the past 15 years, there have been a cadre of people within the U.S. government who've been trained in Persian, who've been deployed around the world uh, in positions where their primary portfolio is Iran. Um, that didn't exist in 79. It didn't exist for a lot of time, but we now have a kind of um, group of American diplomats who, who have at least some familiarity with Iran, who are, whose primary task and purpose is to understand Iran better. And so I think there have been 
real investments in diplomacy. And I think there has been a persistent interest in using diplomacy for most of the past 43 years by the US government, not always effectively. And there have been, of course, these, um, these periods of time, brief, relatively brief periods of time, which you see in the US government issue diplomacy, uh, particularly during the early, the first term of the Bush administration. But even President Trump for all his uh, fire and, and fury for all of the chaos that he wrought, President Trump never um, uh, in any way suggested that it would be in a, inappropriate for American and Iranian diplomats to meet. In fact, you know, it was always well understood that if Trump could have gotten a meeting himself, he would have been the first person on a plane to Tehran to do that. Um, so I think that, you know, the sort of the issue around diplomacy being verboten has always been a bigger issue from the Iranian side, that for most of the first 30 years of the revolution, particularly after Iran-Contra, it was very difficult for Iranian diplomats to have any kind of public contact with American diplomats. Um, that, that has come and gone over time. So obviously, Zarif was uh, in very close touch with his American counterparts uh, during the Obama administration. Um, but we see even now that it's, you know, US diplomats are sitting out in Vienna waiting to speak to anybody <laughs> and um, willing to do that, willing to invest. I mean, this is what I, when I think about, you know, do, have we taken the diplomacy out of the toolbox? Box, I think of Rob Malley, who's been on a plane almost nonstop since he took this uh, role on a little over a year ago um, and who fundamentally hasn't gotten a public meeting with an Iranian counterpart, not because he's unwilling, not because anyone from the Biden administration is unwilling, but because the Islamic Republic is unwilling. And I think that's, that's important to note. Um, in terms of the history of the war, um, uh, I think the questioner must have a different understanding of the history than I do, because I'm not aware of any evidence the US in fact, gave a green light to Saddam Hussein with whom we did not have diplomatic relations at the time of his invasion of Iran. There, were, there was a copious kind of intelligence gathering um, on the part of the US government, obviously watching all of these developments very closely at a time when the Islamic Republic was holding 52 American personnel. Uh, so there was awareness, in fact, a lot of trepidation about an Iraqi invasion, and there wasn't a lot that was done in the immediate aftermath to stop Saddam's invasion of, uh, of Iran. But I don't think that there's any, um, I, or at least I've, I'm not aware of any hard evidence that suggests the United States uh, in some way incentivized uh, Saddam Hussein to uh, invade Iran. U.S. policy at various times leaned heavily in favor of Saddam, but of course, uh, you know, as we all know from Iran-Contra, the U.S. also helped arm the Iranians and provided other in uh, financial incentives as well. So there, um, you know, there's a there's a very sordid history, I think, in terms of U.S. policy during the Iran-Iraq War. I don't think there's a lot to be proud of on on any particular side there. But I would say the primary fault with prolonging the war and with the, the uh, dysfunction that was uh, left in its, le in its wake for Iranians, both economic devastation, human devastation, and uh, a hardening of the government um, was very much a, a set of decisions by the Iranians themselves, by the, by the regime themselves. And of course, Bahman, you've written about this in your own work, um, the decisions that were made in the 1980s. And, particularly the decision to forego an effort by um, then the Gulf Cooperation Council to try to um, devise a ceasefire in which the Iranians would have won reparations. Khomeini's determination to go to Baghdad and eliminate Saddam Hussein's regime um, was, was a catastrophic one for Iran. Um, and, and frankly, this is a debate that Iranians themselves have had many times or over since then. It's been... Um, discussed extensively in the Iranian press uh, by Iranian political figures as well. So um, I think it's important uh, that, you know, when we look at the kind of history of what's happened here to recognize that there, there, there's, there are very few people who are covered in glory when it comes to uh, this history and when it comes to the outcomes, especially uh, with respect to Iran. Mm. Well, yes, absolutely. I think uh... One of the historians of war wrote that no leader would start a war thinking he's going to lose it. <laughs> and maybe Saddam Hussein started the war thinking he's going to win it because of the hostage crisis inside Iran. And the whole fact that Iranian government is so busy with that event, it may not be able to defend himself. That, that's true. So another question has come in asking for you to, to comment on the notion that Western sanctions contrary to intended goals, harm 
the Iranian population, promoting the opposition against the common FOTA's support for the regime. So how should we kind of um, uh, divide up the whole issues of sanctions today that is going on? And the questioner wants to know whether do you think these policies of continuously pushing sanctions, we are actually hurting the Iranian people, therefore increasing the longevity of the regime? <clears throat> I, to me, it gets back to the question of goals. If you ask someone, uh, what, do we, uh, what do we want to accomplish with these sanctions? What's the purpose of, uh, uh, what's the purpose of them? I mean, uh, we've all worked for administrations that you know, never saw a sanction it didn't like, uh, always looking for, um, looking for, other, for other ones. Um, and it was fascinating at the time of the, um, argument over the, J the, the original J the JCPOA back in 2015, 2016, uh, the administration claimed uh, that it was the sanctions that persuaded the Iranians to agree to the, uh, uh, to the, to the, to the JCPOA, to the nuclear deal, to the nuclear deal. Uh, the thing was, they never brought, there was never any evidence of that. And the best, the, the, it's hard to prove one way or the other, but the, the best evidence I saw was that the economic problems uh, uh, in Iran were um, at least 75% uh, self-made, uh, result of mismanagement, corruption, and planning, so, uh, uh, so forth and so on. But it was one of those things that you see very often in policy where, um, it's like someone you you give um, you give someone an examination you give a student an examination and then you say okay you grade your examination give yourself a grade and the people who were urging sanctions who were most um, adamant about the sanctions were then turning around and saying you see they worked they were the ones that were claiming success. Um, if the um, if the if the, the effect of the sanctions is to make the Iranian currency nearly worthless, is it if it's to close um, factories uh, because they can't buy raw material, they have no ability to buy raw materials or spare parts, therefore throwing people out of work, depriving people uh, 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 of work, uh, you'd have to say that the people suffering directly are not the leaders. Um, the leaders, in fact, uh, by, by what I have read and what I have seen, um, are the ones who have the ability to profit because they can, they can get involved in the black market and the smuggling, they can control the black market and smuggling of, sca of scarce goods uh, and, pro and, end up, uh, and end up profiting. Perhaps um, the theory is uh, that by putting so much economic pressure and pain on the population, uh, it's going to cause uh, it's going to cause an overthrow. It's going to cause a uh, so, uh, social disturbances, demonstrations, and people will rebel against the government and overthrow it. Unfortunately, uh, so far that has not proved to be the uh, that, that has not proved to be the case. Um, so again, but as I said, my prob my basic problem with them is um, I don't see what they are for or what they've accomplished. Uh, what I think we, we could agree on here is that whatever whatever we have done, and I won't talk about, I mean talk about the, from the Iranian point of view, you could talk about the, sort of their policies and what their decisions they've made, good decisions, bad decisions. Uh, but for 43 years, um, whatever the US has done to achieve the goals that uh, Suzanne mentioned uh, hasn't worked. Just hasn't worked, whatever we've done. Um, and so maybe, just maybe it's time to think about doing things um, a little bit differently. If what you've done for 43 years hasn't worked, uh, 
perhaps it's time, just time to consider something else. Well, thank you. There are a couple of questions uh, about, uh, again, the diplomacy and Colonel Wilkerson, who both of you know, and he has uh, sent this message saying, our idea of diplomacy these days is that we come to the table knowing that what we want and the other side comes to the table prepared to concede. And then he followed up with other uh, comments saying, our toolbox is full of bombs and bullets and sanctions. So I guess this goes also to other questions that has been coming in. What is the idea of a constructive diplomacy today with you all when we have such a, uh, uh, toolbox and well, every time, as soon as you see diplomacy not getting anywhere, one of the favorite statements of the policymakers that all options are on the table. And so, uh, Susan, you first. Uh, how would you describe American diplomacy and these toolkits of bombs and threats, sanctions, and also wanting the other side to concede rather than? wanting the other side to come to the table to have a better understanding of what is to their interest. I guess I would just dispute the, the concept that our diplomacy is only diplomacy of bombs and sanctions. Uh, knowing the diplomats involved, whether it is uh, Bill Burns, uh, now obviously not a diplomat, but certainly for many years, uh, was intimately involved with this portfolio, first as undersecretary and then as deputy secretary of state, uh, Wendy Sherman in similar roles, uh, some of the other uh, folks that I have worked with closely at the State Department, as I mentioned, Rob Malley, none of these people are people who come with bombs and sanctions in their pockets. They're all people who are trying to solve what is fundamentally a security crisis, not just for the United States, but for many other countries in the region and frankly, for the rest of the world. It's there, there's a reason why uh, certainly uh, up through 2015, the, Iran had really no support for its position that it was purely pursuing nuclear weapons. I think it was Cuba, Venezuela, and Belarus uh, that were sympathetic to the Iranian point of view. The rest of the international community, um, despite very big differences, and including at a time when the United States and Russia were at odds over a, another <laughs> very serious crisis in Europe, there was consensus that Iran's program was inconsistent with a peaceful uh, with peaceful use and that uh, the international community had a, 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 an urgent interest in ensuring that Iran did not develop the means to devise nuclear weapons. Uh, that That's simply, um, simply a, I, I think, a, a clear consensus uh, in terms of, of, a, of a diplomatic goal. Um, and the diplomats that I know who were involved at every level pursued that um, with every tool in the toolbox, which meant they pursued it truly with a, with a desire to make negotiations work. I think back to 2006, the decision by the Bush administration, uh, having held out from uh, being in any way constructively involved with uh, what was then a, a European managed nuclear crisis with Iran, deciding to join the negotiations. Um, and that was with the uh, hope and intent of trying to negotiate with the Iranians. The Iranians wouldn't come to the table. Um, when they did, they wouldn't negotiate. Uh, certainly after Ahmadinejad came into office, uh, his representative to the P5 plus one meetings that took place would come and lecture about his dissertation topic, which happened to be on the subject of the Prophet Muhammad's diplomacy. Uh, the, this was not a, a function of American unwillingness to talk, it was a function of Iranian unwillingness to make concessions on a program that violated their own commitments under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Let's be very clear about this. This wasn't a sort of equal bargain. This was a country that had transgressed some of the most sacred obligations that it has to the international community to prevent the further proliferation of the deadliest and most dangerous weapons in the world and which the international community wanted to ensure did not continue to transgress those commitments. And so what, what took place over all that time included sanctions, included statements like all options are on the table because it became very clear that diplomacy alone was not going to persuade the Islamic Republic to simply shelve its nuclear program. If it had, that would have happened in 2006 or seven or eight or nine, even in 2009, 
I think just before you came back to government, John, there was in fact a, what appeared to be a breakthrough, a confidence building measure that the Iranians then walked away from after American diplomats came back and said, we think we have in fact achieved something with Iran. And it was only at that point that the decision was made to push for another UN Security Council resolution to that European countries, which had for 30 years resisted any economic pressure on Iran, even as John and his colleagues were held and mistreated by Iranian revolutionaries in 79, European countries actually increased their business with Iran. They backfilled the American companies that were forced to leave after the seizure of the American embassy. Japanese officials helped the Iranians evade US sanctions in the early 1980s. They came on board. The entire world came on board with sanctions because of the deep and abiding concern about an Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, armed with nuclear weapons. And unfortunately, that uh, that was what was required. And you know, if you don't believe that sanctions work, ask Ayatollah Khamenei, because he's the one who said, we came to the table in, with the Obama administration only to ensure that sanctions were removed. And so that's, if you don't believe it, then, then I, I think we have to go to Tehran and take it up with him. Sanctions do have an impact on Iranian decision-making calculus. Purely relying on sanctions is not an effective strategy. I think it's quite clear. We saw that under the Trump administration, making uh, uh, your strategy so dependent on sanctions that ultimately you have no other tools in the toolbox. Clearly, that's not effective either. Um, but we are in a, a situation today where we have limited tools to affect Iranian decisions. The most important tool that we have, I would uh, emphasize, is not even simply diplomacy, it's not sanctions, it's not military threats, it's our ability to rally the rest of the world around a common agenda with respect to a, a security challenge or threat. We were able to do that during the Obama administration, and, and it built upon, frankly, diplomacy that preceded it even during the Bush administration. Uh, we're not able to do that today. And that's not really the Biden administration's fault. I don't, you know, they're not able to persuade China to stop uh, buying Iranian oil. That's what has made the sanctions ineffective. That is what has taken, that is part of the reason why um, we've had shuttle diplomacy for more than a year now and we haven't been able to reconstitute or revive the JCPOA. We can't get the Russians to come on board with the same agenda as the United States because they have other interests as well. And so it's a much more complicated international uh, set of dynamics today that make pure diplomacy that much more uh, difficult to achieve. Thank you. Uh, so another person asks this question, how has US policy regarding Saudi Arabia, UAE, Israel limited the likelihood of achieving reconciliation with Iran? John, would you like to take that? Sh sure, well, um, I, I agree with Susan that there's, um, you know, we, we talked about sort of our own problems with policy uh, and, fail, and, and failures, but uh, uh, there's, there's certainly been enough on the Iranian side as well. Um, it's, it's, it's very strange. This is, it's, it's, a, it's a very strange business, but um, the Iranians, I think in the case of, in the case of their Arab neighbors, um, on the one hand, uh, at times they seem to recognize the fact that they are neighbors uh, and they need to, um, whether they like their neighbors or not, they need to reach some kind of uh, accommodation with them. They live in the same neighborhood. You know, you have a neighbor um, on, on the, and the Arab side the same way. I mean, you have a neighbor who plays loud music and doesn't put his garbage out, his dogs bark too much. Uh, you know, what do you do? Well, he's still there. He's not going, that neighbor's not going away. Uh, and uh, so, so you see, a, you see occasional charm offensives where they'll uh, exchange visitors, they'll maybe reopen diplomatic relations, they'll do exchange, they'll do, uh, 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 they'll do exchanges. Um, and then all of a sudden, somebody will come along and make some kind of really stupid statement about, say, so, or do something really stupid, like attack consulate. <laughs> they uh, attack a Saudi consulate some, uh, so, uh, um, somewhere, or, um, do, or, or or even worse, go after an oil field, go to, go after an oil field, or do something, make some kind of statement about um, 
uh, Iranian territory. Uh, Iranian territory. Um, the U.S. doesn't have to do much in this case. I think the the Iranians may, uh, the Iranians themselves um, make a pretty good have made a pretty good hash out of their uh, uh, of their diplomacy. You know, we. Um, I, I've been in meetings where people talk about how skillful, what skillful diplomats the Iranians are, and how clever they are, and how su how uh, how subtle they are. Um, uh, but to me, the some of the di the diplomacy that I've witnessed in the uh, in the Islamic Republic uh, is pretty damn inept. Um, you know, they've they've managed uh, they've they've managed to um, alienate. Uh, people who should be their friends, or at least should be should be neutral um, on on their part, um, and they manage to they, they they have very few friends in the world. I mean, if you look at sort of who their friends are, they're uh, dysfunctional places like Syria um, and maybe parts of Iraq, um, and of all and of all odd places, this landlocked Christian Armenia. Uh, because both sides hate the Azeris so much, uh, uh, hate the Azeris so much. Uh, but that's that's not very. It's it's not very effective. They haven't been effective. Um, and you know, in a, you know, you know, if, if if they were to if one were to sit down and say, okay, what what makes sense in terms of a policy vis-a-vis -vis the Arab neighbor, vis-a-vis -vis the Arab neighbors? Well, antagonizing them doesn't do it. Um, with Israel, with, uh, with with Israel again, uh, I point to you know the the Iranians seem to be their own worst enemies here. Uh, the kinds of statements that you you heard and saw, particularly during the Ahmadinejad period, uh, Ahmadinejad period, made him made him toxic uh, in in Washington. Uh, maybe radioactive is a better word than toxic, but he. Um, he it got to the point again. This was going back to the time I was there. I was there in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Uh, it didn't matter whatever he said. Uh, nobody was listening to him. People stopped listening to what he said about anything. Um, and you know, like the stop clock, he might be right twice a day. He, he occasionally he might make sense, but if he said something sensible, no one was listening to that. You know, if you suggested that, well, maybe there's something here, maybe we should explore this more and said, no, comes from, the, given the source, we're not interested. And that's what happened. And uh, that, you know, somebody said, I, I, I forget who made the comment, it was an Israeli friend who said that uh, when Apani Dijad left office, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu went into mourning. Because he lost his best propaganda tool uh, at that point. Uh, at that at that point, uh, so uh, this to, these to me are examples of uh, examples of not clever diplomacy, not thinking things uh, things out, but. Frankly, uh, uh, dipl diplomatic and uh, diplomatic ineptitude, uh, and we may see that. I mean, we may see. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if the if the if the Saudis decide that they're going to restore some kind of normality with the Iranians, they'll do it, and they'll do it without asking us. Uh, because these are their neighbors; they need to. The same with the same with the people in the UAE. Um, for reasons of economy, for reasons of trade, for all kinds of reasons of population, um, cultural links, whatever they whatever they are, they'll make they'll uh, they'll make that decision. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, to, uh, until now, uh, the Iranians have not made this such a, such steps easy for them. Great. Uh, there are a couple of questions again going back to the revolutionary period. One person has asked, was the American government favoring Khomeini at the beginning in order to keep the Communist Party from power? And another question has asked uh, John if he could reflect on Qutzadeh and Yazdi and how 
his uh, observation about those two gentlemen who are now passed away from Iranian revolution had some form of a meaning for what we are talking about today. Uh, look, I'm I'm not going to even get into this issue of uh, did did the United States why the United States brought Khomeini to power because uh, that's a question I get a lot uh, and it's not did he did did Jimmy Carter bring Khomeini to power but why did he bring Khomeini to power it's an assumption that that that, that he did and I understand that the late Shah. Um, to the end of his life, believed that he'd been done in by the CIA. Um, and in fact, on his deathbed, the story goes, he asked Richard Helms, why'd you do it? Why'd you get rid of me? Um, uh, same thing, there's a wonderful revealing passage in Kai Bird's recent biography of Jimmy Carter, where um, Carter notes in his diary, he says, what, what, what am I supposed to do about Iran? He says, my ambassador, Sol uh, Sullivan, Bill Sullivan says, if Khomeini takes power, Iran will become democratic. But my other emissary, Heiser, says, if Khomeini takes power, Iran will become communist. Well, they're both wrong, Obvious, uh, uh, um, obviously. Um, the role of what's that? I recommend a a BBC series called Son of the Revolution. It's done by BBC Persian. It's in Persian. I don't know if it's been, there's a subtitled version, uh, but it's it's well worth watch. Uh, uh, it's well worth watching, but it gets back to something that we've referred to er, uh, earlier on, uh, that the group of, um, how do you call non-clerical, allies um, of um, Khomeini, you know, what influence did they have and how important were they in persuading foreigners, Westerners, Americans, uh, that this was in fact a democratic movement. Um, and the phrase was, uh, well, Khomeini is nothing more than an Iranian Gandhi. Well, again, you ask the question, how wrong could you be? But, uh, um, but there it was. I've asked some friends who were associated, and they say, and, and they, they're very Iranian friends, and they will be very, very frank. They say, um, we were fooled. We were misled. You know, we wishful thinking. We, we were blind. We didn't see what, what this movement really was and what Khomeini was about. We didn't read his writings. Um, and we believed what we wanted to believe. And we were so obsessed with getting rid of the Shah, we were willing to accept anything, uh, anything else. So this is a final question. I think it will go to Susan. Now, the nuclear negotiations are continuing today. There are, there are signals coming from both sides that there's something happening. And there is something, whether Iranians are conceding again or not, they do want to get back for some uh, deal. So I think one person is asking a question, do you think there is any chance of international educational exchanges to start between US and Iran in the next five years? Um, that's a good question. Uh, let me just quickly say, I do think there will be some resuscitation of the nuclear deal. I, I, I don't think it will be a longer and stronger deal as, as uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken testified when he was first coming into office. I think it will probably be a weaker and shorter deal um, and it won't have uh, much of a half-life simply because the pressures on both sides are, are, are going to make it very difficult to sustain but it will be a step away from the brink and that's a net positive <laughs> at this point, uh, especially given everything else that's happening around the world. Unfortunately, I don't see much of a, a, a good opportunity with or without a deal, frankly, for a renewed uh, exchange program with Iran. And I, I say that with sadness because obviously I was a beneficiary of that and, and I know many others on both sides who have been um, certainly many, many Iranians who, who were able to study in the United States, uh, mostly before the revolution, but even still today. Um, 
uh, unfortunately, the conditions are just not safe. Uh, my good friend, Siamak Namazi, has been held uh, for six years now, um, and uh, his 80 plus year old father as well. There are other Americans who've been held for a number of years on trumped up charges. Uh, we don't, we hope that there has been some signal that perhaps their release could be affected as part of uh, some kind of a wider agreement uh, uh, that has been taking place or that may have been negotiated on the sidelines of the nuclear negotiations. Um, but what we know is that, you know, each time a, a new a, a group of Americans and, and other international hostages are released by Iran, another group is taken. Um, and, you know, over time, it, it, it's just, it's not a safe place to be, unfortunately. Um, and I say that with great sadness. And, I, and unfortunately, it's not always safe for Iranians to come here and participate in some of our uh, visitor programs and some of the other public diplomacy mechanisms that we have. Um, when those were still operational more than a decade ago, um, many of the Iranians ha had, had faced threats when they were returning to Iran. Um, and, and some were unable to even participate because once it became clear they were participating in some kind of a US government funded program on disaster relief or um, other types of you know, purely non-political types of uh, exchanges, uh, they became politicized simply because of the, the, the funding from the United States. So I, I wish that there were a better uh, prognosis here and I will be very happy to be wrong on this and probably many other points. Thanks, Bahman. Thank you. And I want to thank you, both of you, for this really good conversation. I'm sure, as you said, we could talk hours on many of these issues. I hope we have a kind of a encourage more discussions. And I think every year, Iranian Revolution at 43, 44, 45 gives this great opportunity for us to really go back and really start the conversation and talk about what was the problems, policies, observation perception. I want to thank Susan for taking time from her busy schedule to join us and we look forward to seeing more publications activities from you. Please get back to the Iran uh, project as soon as you can. And John, thank you again for coming to our webinars. You've been a great supporter of our institute and we look forward to having you uh, in our future webinar. Please join us on March 14. We have a very unique topic about Utah universities and Iran. How Utah universities in 50s and 60s had a role in economic development in Iran. So we have a scholar from University of Tennessee who's written a book on that subject. And we hope to continue with these webinars and we hope to see you again on future webinars. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will have a recording of this webinar uploaded and sent to everyone.